Well, I'm Eve Bassani. Most of you do know me. Wonderful to see you. And welcome to today's uh, Art Science Activities Lecture. This is our keynote lecture. It's the third one this year. We are very honored to have Dr. Jared Diamond. He's a professor of geography at UCLA. He's the recipient of the Pulitzer Award, the MacArthur Genius Grant, Japan's Cosmos Prize, and National Medal of Honor, and even more, excuse me, National Medal of Science. He has authored many books. Many of us have read his books, and I could I read them, them again. again. I mean, they yeah. are incredible. Uh, somebody's not muted, and I'm getting your feedback. Okay. All right. Um, we live in a very complicated world. Our planet is facing existential challenges. Dr. Jared Diamond speaks in his books, and tonight you will hear the same, and in his lectures with a voice of clarity. Now, we are very excited to also have with us here Dr. Regis Kelly, who will be our moderator. He's a professor of biochemistry and biophysics at UCSF, director of the California Institute of Quantitative Bioscience, QB3. We, oh, okay, somebody else has to mute. All right, uh, Dr. Kelly and Dr. Diamond, to our great pleasure, have had a previous connection and perhaps Dr. Kelly will tell you about that shortly before we get on. And Dr. Jared will take most of the afternoon and then Dr. Kelly will be the moderator. And if you have questions, please put them in the chat. Nancy Mueller will choose some or field some, I would say, probably only have time for about three or four. And with that, let's get started on a very privileged lecture we are about to hear. Thank you. So do you want me to introduce Gary? You've got to mute. Um, thank you. Uh, so uh, I, 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 so um, the uh, I'm going to turn off my computer and try to work on this one because this you got to leave the meeting. She's going to leave the meeting. Can I try again? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So actually, I had the privilege of first hearing Jared when I was an undergraduate in Scotland, um, and he uh, gave a fantastic talk on the flow of water in and out of the gallbladder. It was quite revolutionary. And it was all the discussion of the application of Kedem Kachalski equations. And it was quite inspirational. And uh, Jared and I would, of course, love to go back and talk about nostalgic things and the evolution of the field of physiology. But that's probably not what you all came here to hear today. So I'm going to actually just say my role is to just hear, sit quietly here, enjoy hearing what Jared is going to say. I have the privilege of asking the first couple of questions, unless you guys are and intrusive and insist on doing it yourselves. Um, but then I will try to moderate that and make sure you don't ask any offensive questions to Jared. Okay, but otherwise the floor is your Jared and I will mute myself. Thank you. I'll begin of course, by saying that it's a great pleasure for me to be with you and to be Eve's guest. Let me give a little background about myself and about my relationship with Eve. I've been teaching. Jared, at I am not hearing you. I don't know if other people are or not. Hmm. Can all of you hear me? Yes, I can hear. Yes, it's fine. All right. So I'll give a little background on on myself. Um, I've been teaching at UCLA for 55 years. Um, I believe I'm the longest serving. Uh, 
if people are not me are hearing Jared, can you just put your thumbs up? Okay, so it's my computer. Thank you. No. No. Can everybody hear me okay? No. I cannot hear. Yeah. Nancy, can you hear me okay? So. Maybe Nancy could help. Nancy, you're on Nancy, mute. can you unmute Jared? Nancy, you're muted. I'm sorry, I am muted, but I did mute myself. But uh, Jared, start talking and let's see if we just can hear you now. All right, so, so well, I seem to be unmuted here and I see some people raising their thumbs, um, either confirming that they can hear me or thumbs up of gladiatorial disapproval. Anyways, so I, I was saying that I've been teaching at UCLA for 55 years as I think the longest serving UCLA faculty member. I'm turned 84 years old two months ago. Um, I love my job. I teach undergraduates, mostly ages 18 to 22. I live in a house near UCLA with my wife, Marie. It's from Marie's study that you see in the background that I'm talking to you. And our twin sons, Max and Joshua live nearby. Like many Americans, um, our family has been partly locked down because of COVID. It's been difficult or impossible for us to travel. I took my first trip overseas in two years just last week. And many of us, many of you I'm sure, haven't seen our parents, our brothers and sisters, most of our friends for more than a year. As for my connection with Eve, Eve and I go back close to 20 years now. Um, Eve, I regard as a dear friend. Among the many things we share are our European family connections. Eve came to the United States around the same time that the parents of my wife came to the United States from Poland um, just after the Second World War. My father was born abroad. My grandparents, all my grand grandparents came to the United States. And while I was born in the US, um, I've lived in Europe for, for um, five years. And so Eve and I have had this European connection as well as our bonding. It's a great pleasure to, to be invited to, to this event by Eve. We're going to talk um, this evening about global solutions to global problems such as COVID. And COVID is an emerging disease. It's a new disease. We never heard of COVID before December 2019. So it's an emerging disease like so many other recent emerging diseases. Let's talk about the history of emerging diseases to get some perspective on COVID. Um, of course, COVID is not the first emerging disease in human history. There have been lots of other emerging diseases. Just think of the famous big epidemics of the past. Think of the Black Death plague of the Middle Ages. Think of the plague of Justinian that racked the Roman Empire. Think of the plague of Athens, described vividly by the great Greek historian Thucydides. Think of the cholera epidemics that spread around the world in the 1800s. Think of the so-called Spanish flu, which was not a Spanish flu at all. It was the influenza epidemic that spread around the world um, at the end of World War I. So those are some examples of diseases that emerged that were previously unknown. The microbes that cause these diseases have often shaped human history. For example, thousands of years before the Black Death caused by plague in medieval Europe, there was a previous spread of plague about 4,000 years ago that may have contributed to the intrusion of peoples from the Asian steppe carrying Indo-European languages into Europe with the result that most Europeans today, except for Eve and her fellow Hungarians and Finns and Estonians, 
and Basques, all other Europeans have as their native languages, Indo-European languages that may have arrived thanks to the plague 4,000 years ago. Later, Native Americans, so many Native Americans died of European introduced diseases. We think of the contest between Native Americans and Europeans as being fought on the battlefield with cowboy and Indian like stories. But in fact, far more Native Americans died in bed from European germs than died on the battlefield from European swords and guns. Those then are historical consequences, deep historical emerging diseases that preceded COVID. Those diseases had lots of effects on human history. They killed lots of people to take the simplest effect. They caused depopulation. For example, when Europeans, DeSoto, first came through the US Southeast in the 1530s, he found the US Southeast densely populated by Native Americans living in towns, big towns. And DeSoto and his expedition, most of them died. Europeans didn't return to the US Southeast until the late 1600s, at which point virtually all of those towns that DeSoto had seen had disappeared. Why? Probably the result of European diseases introduced by DeSoto and other Europeans. Diseases created vacant land, for example, in medieval Europe. Plague killed off one third of Europeans and the result was lots of empty farmland. Diseases affected battles. Think of Napoleon retreating from Moscow and his army devastated. Maybe 90% of his army was wiped out by typhus. Diseases caused replacements of peoples. I mentioned the replacements of Native Americans by Europeans. Diseases caused collapses of empires. They caused the collapse of the Aztec empire in Mexico, which was undermined by smallpox. Diseases contributed to the collapse of the Inca empire. So the Aztec and Inca empire, the two most powerful states, political entities in the new world, both undermined by European diseases. Diseases decimated Polynesian Hawaii, they clobbered the Mongol Empire, and diseases of the past administered blows to economies. The Mongol Empire, the Mongols, for example, Mongol trade was undermined by probably plague, and Europe declined, the economy of Europe declined from the Black Death, but a century later, the economy of Europe was stimulated by the Black Death because they were the same quantity of resources spread among fewer people. So each individual European was on the average richer a century after the Black Death. Those then are consequences of the plagues of the past. Where did these new diseases like COVID and all these other emerging diseases, where did they come from? Modern new diseases that you know of, that you've ex all of us have experienced in our lifetimes, include COVID that emerged in 2019, SARS that emerged in 2002, MERS that emerged in 2012, AIDS that emerged in 1981, Ebola that emerged in 1976, Marburg in 1967, and mad cow disease in 1996. So those are new diseases that have emerged within the last 50 years. But there are lots of new diseases that emerged in the last 10,000 years, such as smallpox and measles and many others. These are new diseases. Where do these new diseases come from? Turns out that new human diseases almost always come to us from diseases of animals with which we humans come into close contact. The recent emerging diseases, such as COVID and SARS and MERS, those have come to us from wild animals. SARS came to us from civets in Southeast Asia and ultimately from bats through Southeast Asian animal markets. MERS came to us from camels and ultimately from bats. AIDS came to us from chimpanzees. So those are wild animals from which we acquired diseases. 
But in the past, we also acquired diseases from domestic animals with which we were in very close contact. Measles and more recently mad cow disease came to us from cattle. Smallpox may have come to us from camels. And at the end of World War I and in waves frequently since then, flu came to us from pigs and ducks. So new human diseases have come to us from diseases of animals. They come to us mainly from what animals? They don't come to us from oysters and worms. New diseases of humans instead come to us mainly from our closest relatives, the mammals, especially from apes and monkeys, because apes and monkeys are the animals chemically most similar to us. And so it's easiest for a disease of a ape or monkey to jump to humans than for a disease of a worm to jump to humans. Diseases have also jumped to humans from other mammals, such as civets and cows. Rarely diseases come to humans from snakes and fish and crabs. They don't come to us from insects. And you may say, what about all those diseases that come to us from mosquitoes and ticks? Well, human diseases don't come to us from mosquitoes and ticks. Mosquitoes and ticks and other insects instead transmit to us diseases that originate from other mammals. Yellow fever and plague and malaria are diseases of other animals that came to us humans transmitted through insects, but insects were not the source of the disease. So there have been dozens of new emerging diseases. COVID is hardly the first new emerging disease. What then, if anything, is new about COVID when it's one among dozens, hundreds of other new emerging diseases? Well, there are two things that are new about COVID. The epidemics of the past were regional. Until the so-called Spanish flu at the end of World War I, the epidemics of the past were regional. That's to say they were confined to certain parts of the world. Why? Because in the past, they were not jet planes. They were not steamships that now can spread diseases. The emerging diseases of the past arose in particular areas, and they largely remained confined to those areas until in recent times they were spread by movements of people. So one distinction of COVID is that it's a disease that spread, has spread rapidly around the world, not because of anything distinctive about COVID, but because of jet planes and steamships, which were not around at the time of the plague of Athens or the plague of Justinian. That's one thing new about COVID then, that COVID has spread globally very quickly. The other thing that's distinctive about COVID is that in the past, when diseases spread, they spread from people who had long experience of those diseases and had developed some genetic and antibody resistance to those diseases. And they spread to those protected population, from protected populations to susceptible populations, populations that had no exposure to those diseases. And so, for example, when Europeans came to the New World, they brought with them smallpox and measles and tuberculosis, to which Europeans, through thousands of years of exposure, had some genetic resistance. But Native Americans had no genetic resistance to those diseases. So the diseases of the past were diseases that spread from exposed populations with some protection to unexposed populations that had no protection. And that meant that the diseases of the past were selective killers. That's not the case with COVID. Uh, COVID, a new emerging disease, there's no human population that had previous exposure to COVID. There's no human population that is protected against COVID. And so COVID is killing people all around the world. Whereas the diseases of the past, the epidemics of the past were selective. That's the other thing that's new about um, COVID, that nobody is protected against um, uh, COVID. Whereas the diseases of the past were diseases that spread to susceptible people from people with some genetic and immune resistance. What then about the effects of COVID compared to the historical effects of the plagues of the past? 
well, we're in the middle of COVID. And so we think today of COVID as being a devastating disease. The reality is that COVID is not going to kill a high percentage of the world's population. At most, COVID kills something like 2% of unvaccinated people. And therefore, even if COVID, as is likely, spreads everywhere around the world, COVID at most would kill 2% of the world's population. The world has 7.5 billion people, so COVID is not going to kill more than 150 million people. Whereas AIDS, everybody infected with AIDS dies of AIDS, or mad cow disease. Everybody infected with mad cow disease dies of mad cow disease, or Ebola. 70% of Ebola victims die of Ebola. Or in the past, smallpox, 30% of smallpox victims before vaccination died of smallpox. That means then that COVID is not going to cause depopulation of the world because at most it will kill 2% of the world's population. COVID is not going to create much vacant land because it doesn't kill that many people. COVID probably will not affect the outcomes of battles and wars. COVID is not going to cause population replacements, whereas European diseases did cause Native Americans and Pacific Islanders to be largely replaced by Europeans. Why? Because today with COVID, all populations around the world are susceptible to COVID. There's no population that's going to replace some other population as a result of COVID. No population is immune to COVID. COVID is not going to cause collapses of societies. What COVID does have is big effects on trade, as was true for plague in its effect on trade in the Mongol Empire. Less than ask. The bad effects of COVID, while not nearly as severe as the bad effects of plague and the diseases of the past, COVID has had lots of bad effects. Let me ask now, how might COVID cause our world to change for the better? And your first reaction to my speculating how COVID might cause the world to change for the better is, oh my God, what an obscene idea. How could this person talk about as a disease that kills people and is shattering our economies? How on earth could COVID create a better world? That's certainly my own strong initial reaction to COVID because my wife, Marie and I, we're still in a state of shock from the deaths of five of our closest friends this year, friends whom we had treasured for 50 or 60 years. Those friendships of 50 or 60 years are irreplaceable. And so I don't have to be convinced of the horrors of COVID. Yes, that means that it certainly is an obscene idea today to look for any good in COVID. But let's ask, what is the world gonna be like a few years from now when most of the world's peoples may be vaccinated against COVID? What's unique about COVID is that, and this is why COVID may cause the world to change for the better. A unique thing about COVID is that for the first time in human history, People everywhere around the world are being forced to recognize that all of us face a global problem that demands a global solution. That's something that has never happened before in human history. Jet planes guarantee that no country can solve its COVID problem by itself. Even if the United States succeeded in eliminating COVID within the US, not very likely or Singapore came close to eliminating COVID within Singapore. The fact is that no country can solve its COVID problem by itself because as long as the COVID virus exists anywhere in the world, any country that temporarily eliminates COVID within its borders is just going to get reinfected by travelers from other countries that have not eliminated COVID. And you know that that's happened recently in so many countries China and Vietnam reinfected, and within the last week, Australia and New Zealand that were hoping to keep COVID out of their boundary. Australia and New Zealand within the last week both gave up the struggle, recognizing that they were not going to be able to keep COVID out, and Australia and New Zealand 
um, have resumed international travel because they recognize there's no way that they're going to keep COVID out. Um, there's no country that's going to be safe against COVID until the whole world is safe against COVID. We recognize COVID as a problem. Why? Because COVID kills its victims within a week or two. Um, there's no doubt that COVID's victims died of COVID. But I mentioned that even in the worst case scenario, COVID might at max kill, what, 170 million people out of the world's population, 7.7 .7 billion, and economies are going to recover. That makes COVID a minor problem. COVID is really a bagatelle compared to the three really big global problems that kill people slowly and unspectacularly and indirectly and th that threaten to destroy our economies forever. You all know what those three big problems of humanity are. They are, of course, climate change and unsustainable use of world resources and the consequences of inequality among the world's people, peoples. Let's just remind ourselves of the effects of these really big global problems compared to which COVID is minor. Climate change, what does climate change do to us? Climate change means on the average warming of the world and more extreme weather fluctuations. Climate change also means decreased rainfall, so drought. Drought means decreased food supplies. You may say, well, the world is getting warmer, but warm temperatures should mean more crop production. Why isn't COVID good for agriculture in the world's food supply? Well, I'm, 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 sorry, why isn't climate change? COVID's on my mind. Why, why isn't climate change good for the world's food supply? And the reason is that climate change not only stimulates the growth of wheat and rice, it also stimulates even more the growth of weeds that overgrow wheat and rice. So that the, the net result of climate change is decreased food supply and famines. Climate change also causes the spread of diseases. As the temperate zones are getting warmer, diseases of the tropics are spreading to the, to the temperate zones. And so I just come back from Italy. In Italy, um, a disease called chukungunya fever, a tropical disease of Uganda, unknown in Italy until recently. And because of climate change, chukungunya fever has spread to Italy. Dengue is, and even malaria are spreading into temperate areas because of climate change. Climate change is also causing rising sea levels because of melting of the polar ice caps, the Greenland and the Antarctic ice caps, and the big glaciers of the Himalayas and Alaska. So rising sea levels means the potential for floods in low-lying areas. It will happen to Florida, but it's already happened within the past half year. There were big floods in the Asian country of Bangladesh, and nearly half the population of Bangladesh, the houses were flooded. Why? Because so much of Bangladesh lies within a few feet of sea level, and therefore with rising sea level and storms, seawater was driven inland across Bangladesh, and a large fraction of the pop population of Bangladesh lost their houses. Many of them died because of rising sea level from melting of the glaciers. Also, climate change and acidification of the oceans from carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Climate change is damaging and destroying the coral reefs of the world, but that is really bad news for us humans because coral reefs are the breeding grounds, the nurseries of so many fish, including fish of the ocean, open oceans, fish on which we humans depend for so much of our, our protein but also coral reefs protect coastlines against tsunamis. And so with the destruction of coral reefs, tsunamis can now sweep inland. Tsunamis that previously would have been held offshore um, against which coastal people would have been protected by coral reefs. So those then are some of the 
consequences for humans of climate change. One of the three big dangers that dwarf COVID and that in the long run have the potential for killing all of us and destroying the world's economy. Climate change then is one of the three big risks to us humans. You know that a second big risk to us humans is decreased resources. We humans depend upon natural resources. We tend upon, depend upon trees, seafood, fresh water, topsoil. We depend upon forests and for our timber and for paper but we humans are chopping down the world's forests. If we chop down trees no faster than new trees grow up, forestry would be sustainable. And in fact, many forest plantations are managed sustainably. But unfortunately, most of the world's forests are being managed unsustainably. We're chopping down trees faster than those trees are regrowing. And so the world's forests are shrinking. And that's bad news for us because we tend to depend upon forests for timber and paper. Another resource on which we depend is, is seafood, the world's fisheries. Again, fisheries could be managed sustainably. Some fisheries are managed sustainably. The West Coast Pollock fishery, which provides the fish for McDonald's fish and chips is managed sustainably. Alaska wild salmon fishery possibly is being managed sustainably. But most of the world's fisheries are not being managed sustainably. I grew up eating Atlantic swordfish. And I have not eaten Atlantic swordfish in recent decades. And none of you has eaten Atlantic swordfish in recent decades. You may object, you, I've eaten swordfish. Yes, you have eaten swordfish. And what you ate was Pacific swordfish. Atlantic swordfish has already been over harvested. So it's commercially extinct. We didn't manage Atlantic swordfish properly. Fresh water, um, the world's fresh water supply we are depleting. Um, as things stand now, the freshwater supplies of the world that are not being exploited by us humans are confined to remote places, rivers of Iceland, some rivers of Northwestern Australia and rivers of Northern Siberia. Those are the world's freshwater supplies that are not exploited by us humans. Your reaction may be, so what if we're depleting the world's fresh water. We can always make more fresh water by desalting ocean water. Yes, we can desalt ocean water, but that requires energy, it requires lots of energy. And we are already um, depleting our energy supplies. So we can't, can't just meet our needs of fresh water by desalting salt water. We are limited by energy and we can't do it. And then topsoil, we're also depleting the soil that is the basis of agriculture. Topsoil gets washed into, the, into rivers, like into the Mississippi River, and ends up in the ocean. As a dramatic Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. So topsoil, soil is being washed into the, into the ocean. And as a dramatic example of this, when I was invited some years ago to talk at Iowa State University in Ames, Iowa, I flew into the airport, which is about 20 miles from Iowa State University. And my host drove me to Iowa State and we drove past, it was mostly flat land, corn, growing corn. And then we came to an amazing site. There was a church perched on a area of land raised 30 feet above all the farmland. And, I, and, and there was a cemetery around the church. And I asked my host, why is that church and that cemetery perched 30 feet above all the rest of the land here? My host explained to me, um, that church illustrates what the level of soil was before European agriculture a century and a half ago. Agriculture has depleted the topsoil. And the reason that that church is 30 feet up above the rest of the land is that people do not farm on churchyards and people do not farm in cemeteries. So that church and the cemetery, that's what's left 
of the formal level of topsoil 30 feet above where it is now. 30 feet of topsoil have been washed into the ocean from Iowa, leaving just the church um, perched up there. Those then, that, th those are examples of unsustainable use of the world's resources, of the world's forests and seafood and fresh water and topsoil. And the third, the third and last of these major problems threatening human society, besides climate change and unsustainable use of resources, is of course inequality around the world. There are rich countries and there are poor countries. 60 years ago, rich countries didn't care that they were poor countries um, out there. Uh, nowadays, rich countries have to care that there are poor countries out there because with globalization, with increased transport, people in poor countries have ways of venting their frustration and their rage at rich countries by doing things like the World Trade Center attack and by unstoppable movements of people around the world and also by the spreads of diseases from poor countries with inadequate health systems to rich countries. Those then are the three big risks to the world today, not COVID, but climate change and decreased availability of resources and inequality around the world. Those problems, not COVID, are the really big problems threatening the world. But you may say, we are mounting a global response to COVID. Why on earth have we not mounted a global response to climate, to those really big problems? Why haven't we already mounted a global response to climate change and resource depletion and inequality? Because those problems are much more serious than COVID. Why then are we mounting a global response to this really rather minor problem of COVID? Why not? The answer is obvious. The answer is it's because COVID kills people visibly and quickly within a week or two. And there's no doubt that people who died of COVID died of COVID. If you die of COVID, there's no doubt that you died of COVID. You died directly of COVID. And if you die of COVID, then you've died within maybe two days, certainly max within a week or a couple of weeks of getting, getting infected. But climate change doesn't kill quickly, and climate change doesn't kill unequivocally and visibly, as does COVID. Instead, climate change kills us and ruins our economies much more slowly and subtly and indirectly than does COVID. For example, about 10 years ago, there was an enormous, there was a big tsunami that hit the Indonesian island of Sumatra and 200,000 Indonesians drowned of that tsunami. What did Indonesians say that their parents and their children and their siblings died of? They said, our relatives died of a tsunami. They died of drowning. Yes, the immediate cause of their death was drowning, but the ultimate cause of their death was climate change because climate change had destroyed the coral reefs protecting the coasts of Sumatra. And so the tsunami swept inland, which was not the case before. The direct cause of deaths was the tsunami, but the ultimate cause of the deaths of those 200,000 Indonesians was climate change. Again, all those, those 70 million people in Bangladesh who lost their homes and all those people in, in Bangladesh who died of the recent floods in Bangladesh. People of Bangladesh said, we lost our homes and our relatives died because of a flood, because of inundation from the oceans. Yes, that's true. But why was there a flood and inundation from the oceans? It's because Bangladesh lies a few feet above sea level and because of the rise of sea level. Now, when there's a storm in the oceans, in the past, that storm would not have inundated Bangladesh, but now with the rise of rising sea level, the storm did um, inundate Bangladesh. Those are then examples of how climate change kills us indirectly and slowly, whereas COVID kills us directly and quickly. And the result is that, clim is that COVID has caught our attention and climate change has not caught our attention. But climate change like COVID 
demands a global response. The microbes that cause COVID are mixed in the atmosphere. If the United States eliminated COVID, but Canada did not within the next hour, the United States would be reinfected with microbes from Canada or from Mexico. And similarly, carbon dioxide. Um, climate change is due to carbon dioxide and methane, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Uh, suppose the United States reduced our burning of fossil fuels and reduced our production of carbon dioxide. Does that mean that, that the United States would now have no more global warming and the rest of the world would have global warming? Of course not. It's because carbon dioxide moves in the atmosphere just as do the microbes of COVID. No country can reduce its own atmospheric carbon dioxide levels just as no country can reduce the levels of COVID microbes in the atmosphere over a country. COVID then and our global war against COVID are teaching us a lesson. And that lesson is that it's the lesson of global problems that demand global solutions. We've had global problems before, but we have not had a global problem that captures our attention as does COVID. And so my hope is that once our global response to COVID starts to de defeat COVID, we will thereby learn finally how to mount and the necessity for mounting global responses to climate change and resource depletion and inequality and those other really big global threats. In short, my hope is that the global problem of COVID uh, that does catch our attention and that may inspire us to find a global solution to, to the global problem of COVID. My hope is that we will generalize and recognize that the really serious global problems of climate change, resource depletion, and, in, and inequality also require global solutions as does COVID. And if, if, if that happens, if, it's not certain, but if, then COVID's tragedy may have caused our world to change for the better. That's my hope then that COVID will inspire us to look for global solutions to global problems. And I think I've talked for enough, enough now and all of you will have thoughts of your own and questions of your own. So I will now pause myself and I will turn it over to you for your own thoughts. Thank you, Dr. Diamond. Regis, would you like to start with uh, some commentary yourself? There's a couple questions in the chat, which we can go to uh, if you have, yeah. if you would like to. Yeah, thank you, Nancy. Uh, fantastic talk, Darren, thank you. Um, but let me take a slightly different approach to this. You think we've learned positive things from COVID that will help us with the climate change. But let me make an argument based on one of the questions uh, we got here. You know, why was, if it was only 2% killed, why was there such a big, why was a big response in America? That, that thing, that number, appreciate one of the things that really has been one of our challenges, right? Many of the people in the country think this whole COVID thing was exaggerated. It was exaggerated for political reasons. And that has led to a distrust of scientists and of science and of the people. Of, and they say, well, if we don't trust us about COVID, why are they going to try and don't believe science about COVID? Isn't that going to make it even worse trying to get public support for things on the climate work? The COVID has really actually done damage to America appreciation of the importance of science in solving problems? That's an important question. It's a big question and it's a complicated question, one that I'm very much concerned with now. Um, the, here's the paradox. The United States, the world leader in science, is also the world leader in skepticism of science. Of first world countries, um, there is no first world country where skepticism about science is so entrenched as in the United States. Why? Um, that's a question that concerns me uh, now. Um, we can speculate about it. I think rather than get on with a speculation, I'll just leave you with a fact that you're all familiar with. Uh, any of you who has been to Europe, any of you who has been to Canada, any of you who has been to Australia knows that there's not the entrenched skepticism about science 
that there is in the United States. Why? It's unfortunate, but as you say, it's an obstacle to our dealing with COVID, and it's also an obstacle to our dealing with climate change. So, Dad, let me ask a, a question which came from Jerry Vecchio, although I'll put it in slightly different terms. You know, the question is about the expanding population is a major concern. And I think the reason that COVID spread so fast is because of the extensive population, the extent the reason we're running through the planet's resources is our overextended population. Now, here's a scenario, right? If I were a crazy guy and I believed I wanted to solve climate, right, the problems of climate growth, right? And, and the only way to do it is reduce the population. Well, what I could do is combine the virulence of Ebola with the infect Ebola, with the infectivity of COVID and reduce the population to 10% of its normal value and therefore give the planet a couple of decades to try and get itself under control. You, are you worried a bit that this, that this, you know, this frustration about not being able to solve climate work might trigger some radical thinking of this type? I'm worried about other things. Um, as, for, as for population, certainly it, it was the case a few decades ago that population was regarded as the world's biggest problems, as the world's biggest problem. Now we know better. The problem is not the number of people. The problem is consumption by all those people. There are big differences in rates of consumption, rates of consumption of water, of oil, of timber, of metals by the world's people. Uh, the average American, the average European and Japanese consumes 32 times more water and oil and timber than does the average citizen of the developing world. So the problem of the world is not the number of people. If, if all of the world's 7 billion people were in cold storage and refrigerators and not consuming, uh, those 7 billion people would not be a problem for the world. The problem for the world is not all those people. The problem for the world is those rich, high consumption people, first and foremost, us Americans, followed somewhat closely by Europeans and Australians. Um, and if, so the, in short, what I'm worried about is not the number of people. What I'm worried about, about is consumption by those people. Uh, the wor if we kept the world 7 billion people, or even if the world crept up to 9 billion people, which is possible, and consumption rates in the United States drop down to consumption rates in Europe. Consumption rates in the US are about twice those in Europe. Or if consumption rates in the United States drop down to consumption rates in Kenya, which is not very likely, the number of people in the world will not be a problem. And the fact is that we Americans, something like half of our consumption is wasted because Consumption rates in Europe are half those in the United States, but by any reasonable measure, the standard of living in Europe is better than that in the United States. So I'm much, in short, long in a way to say, I'm worried about consumption rates. I'm not worried about the number of people. So uh, let me ask the last question, then I'll pass it over to Nancy to do these things here. And it sometimes seems to me, you know, almost everyone I know in our community cares about climate change, but as long as it's a distant problem, if you sort of said, well, you have to give up traveling in airplanes around the world to your favorite places, your, your, your vacations in Europe and so on, or if you had to buy less things in Walmart, probably say, oh, you know, it, yes, climate change is a problem, but it's not that much of a problem. Can you see any way of getting Americans to want to make less of an impact on the world? Any good question, any way to, to get Americans to make less of an impact on, on the world? Um, two ways. One is, as more and more Americans suffer more and more from climate change, um, so here, here, here I am and many of you are in California, and in California it's getting hotter and hotter and there's droughts and we're getting more and more forest fires in California. Um, we Californians, the most popular state in the U.S., we are suffering more and more from climate change and some Californians are getting, getting um, 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 convinced of this. Uh, so that's one way to convince Americans. And another way, a friend of mine up the street from me uh, lives a friend who is a climate skeptic. And my friend who is involved in the sustainability program, we walked up the street, we happened to talk with my friend who's a climate skeptic. And my climate skeptic friend said, what about climate change? Um, why do we have to be concerned about that? And my friend said to him, why do you have to be concerned about that? 
Do you have children and do you have grandchildren? Well, what do you want the world of your children and your grandchildren to be like? And my friend paused. So those are the things that may convince Americans to take climate change seriously. So Jared, this is great, but I want to not just have this professorial talk and then but pass this over to Nancy so she can uh, moderate the, the questions coming in from chat. Is that, that the protocol, sure, Nancy? Yeah, and you did a good job. Thank you. So I would like to put out a couple more questions I think are really interesting, also from Jared DeVecchio. Is the skepticism of science a long-term issue or has it evolved in recent years? Is it mostly political? Big question, good question. I'm smiling at Eve's picture on the screen because Eve and I were corresponding about this recently. Is the skepticism about science uh, recent, um, what about the political aspects um, of it? Um, good question. Um, I think that the American skepticism about, about science has long-standing roots. Um, partly it's connected with the distinctive role of religion in the United States. The United States is not only the first world country um, with the most skepticism of science, the United States is also the first world country with the strongest commitment to religion. And often that commitment to religion is of distinctive types of religion that involve skepticism to science. But the, the American reaction to science has also grown because for, for science was not a big deal in the United States until surprisingly recently. Um, recently, a um, couple of weeks ago, I just went through the list of Nobel Prize winners of different countries around the world. Um, and the United States was not a bit, not a significant player in science. Nobel Prize, Nobel Prizes in science virtually all went to Europeans. It was only, I think, until World War II, the number of Americans who had won Nobel Prizes in science it was trivial, maybe something like six. Nowadays, the United States wins more Nobel Prizes in science than all the rest of the world put together. So the growth of science in the United States is a relatively recent phenomenon. That's the growth of the power of science, but hand in hand with the growth of the power of science is also the growth of resistance and skepticism to science. There's one more other question that I think is really interesting. Since chemical pollution and climate change are both major threats, this is from William Goodson, which one is more likely to be permanent? Or stated another way, which one is most possibly reversible? You are now about to see why journalists get frustrated out of their mind by when they interview Jared Diamond, because whenever a journalist asks me, what is the most important da da da, my answer always is, Stop looking for the most important da da da. There are lots of important things. Um, any, um, any of you um, uh, uh, who, uh, all of you who are married or who have been married, all of you who looked at marriage of your friends, uh, you know that, that if a couple about to get married asks you, what is the most important factor for a happy marriage? You can be sure that that couple is going to get divorced within the next several years because for a happy marriage, you need you cannot look for the one most important thing. You have to agree about religion and children and sex and money and politics and da 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 da. There are about 37 essential requirements for a happy marriage. And if you get 36 of them right and you don't agree about money or sex or religion, your marriage will end in divorce. So my, my answer then to your question about what is more important chemical pollution or climate change. Don't ask what's more important than chemical pollution or climate change. Both are important. It's like asking me, um, do I prefer the left hand or the right hand and my wife, Marie? I love both of them. <laughs> Thank you. Would anyone like to um, ask their question from chat again? Or um, Linda, would you please um, unmute yourself and make a comment? Thank you so much, Jared. I'm I'm very curious what your students, are you assuming you are still an honored and, and cherished professor at UCLA, 
Um, when your students hear this news, I, I mean, I know how it affects me and I'm sure everyone else on this lecture, uh, this wonderful talk tonight. When your students hear this, what do you, are there optimists among them? Are there, um, are they too skeptics? I mean, what do you find in this younger generation? What do I find in this younger generation? Um, it's an issue acute for me because the younger generation includes Marie and my, and my twin sons who are 34 years old and a part of the younger generation. What do I see in the younger generation? The younger generation on the whole takes the world's environmental problems more seriously than the older generation. They are less ignorant than the older generation. They are less in denial than the older generation. And they know that they're gonna be affected by these problems for a long time to come. My sons, an American man, an American man who's in adult years, the life expectancy of an, an American man who's reached, say, the age of 70 is something like 93. So my sons have about 60 years ahead of them. But, but I, at age 84, statistically, I've got maybe about 10 years ahead of me. My sons are going to have to cope with these phenomena much more than the older people. Um, and so on the one hand, young people know that they're going to face the consequences that old people are not. Old people are messing up their world. Um, on the other hand, young people, they're concerned. Um, young people wrestle with the question of whether to have children. So many young people today say, I don't want to have children. I don't want to bring children into the world because I don't like the prospects for what the world is going to be like. I don't like the prospects for the world 10 years from now and the world 50 years from now when my children, if I have children right now, 50 years from now, my children will be at the peak of their lives, but 50 years from now, at the rate that things are going, if we don't fix climate change, 50 years from now, the world will really be in bad shape. So in short, the way that, young, the way that I see young people reacting is that they face the consequences of the bad decisions made by us older people, but at the same time, they are much more worried, worried to the point of debating whether they're going to have children. Excellent. Any other questions, comments? Please. Oh, I, I'm hold on. I'm going to get to better. You're on mute, Eve. Eve, you're on mute. Eve, can you unmute yourself? Eve, you need to unmute yourself. There you go. Good. Okay, Eve, you're on. <laughs> Reg, do you have a comment? <laughs> Nancy? Hi, this is Chris Forbes. I have a question for Dr. Diamond. Thank you, Chris. Please ask it. Eve, you're going to come next. Okay, so Dr. Diamond, I enjoyed your talk. Thank you very much. Um, you were talking about infectious diseases, um, mainly coming from mammals. And I was wondering um, what your thoughts are about the possibility of some of these coming from lab research. Um, diseases like COVID or SARS, because I don't know that that question has been fully answered necessarily. And secondly, do you think that uh, gain of function research should be performed? Could you just repeat the last part of your question? What research? Yeah. Do you think gain of function research in some of these labs? that are in places around the world should be performed? Sure. So my diseases come from labs. There have been diseases that came from labs. The last person who died of smallpox, the last person who died of smallpox outdoors was in the country of Somalia. But the last person who died of smallpox at all was a technician in the laboratory in the UK, in Britain. There was a mistake with it. It was not intentional. There was a mistake in the lab and someone got infected with smallpox and they, they died of smallpox. There is debate, debate now, where did COVID come from? The fact is we, we, we don't have a smoking gun 
as to where COVID, COVID came from. What we can say is that the microbe of COVID um, genetically is most similar to three species of bats in Southeast Asia. And we have the precedent of SARS. Humans don't come into contact that much with bats, but bats do come into contact with other animals. And it appears that SARS came to us humans from bats transmitted by civet cats. So the prevalent view about how COVID spread was that it came from wild, wild animal markets where there's enormous, in the wild animal markets of Southeast Asia, there are thousands and tens of thousands of animals that have been wild animals that have been brought into these wild animal markets and <laughs> thousands and millions of people coming in contact with them. So there's ample opportunity. Theoretically, it's possible that COVID could have spread, spread from a laboratory. There's been suspicion about that. Um, there's still debate about it. Uh, my guess is that COVID came to us from wild animals, just like other diseases came to us from wild animals. As for labs, what about labs? Labs working on diseases? Well, for heaven's sakes, labs have to work on diseases. We would not have vaccines against COVID unless there were labs that were working on, on COVID and other coronaviruses and working on vaccines. So uh, just, as, just as science can be used for the good and for the bad, the splitting of the atom um, provides the energy, something like 70 to 90% of the energy for France, but the splitting of the atom also killed 100,000 people and 30,000 people at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So laboratories, science in general, can be used for good purposes or for bad purposes. We need science. It's our choice how we're going to use science. Right. I, I agree with what you said about the fact that there's good and bad that can come out of them. But the real question is, so if we have gain of function research, you know, what kinds of controls need to be in place to assure that we don't have accidental release, uh, you know, uh, release that is maybe intentional in some form or other? So what's the world's responsibility in that sense? Good question. So what are the controls against lab accidents or escapes from the laboratory? Welcome to doing laboratory research at UCLA and at any other institution in the United States. And I think at any institution in any first world country and at many institutions in non-first world countries. If you want to do laboratory research at UCLA, you have to file a application that describes in detail what you do. And if you want to work particularly with significant diseases, there is careful scrutiny. The scrutiny that we undergo at UCLA, it makes us scientists at UCLA tear our hair out at all of the hoops that we have to jump through in order to do laboratory research. But Thank God that UCLA has these committees and that every other university has these committees and that we tear our hair out because there are strict controls about what goes on. Of course, whenever, whenever anything happens with us humans, there are mistakes. At UCLA, there was a accident a couple of years ago in a chemistry lab and someone died as a result of it. Um, the controls were upgraded um, but wherever there's a risk, there will be mistakes. And so in short, long-winded long -winded answer, there already are controls and the controls of laboratories, like all other controls, are not 100% foolproof. So I'm going to ask the last question on behalf of Reg Kelly, because this kind of wraps it up. Um, Jared argued in upheaval that we can learn about national crises by looking at how we, how we solve political crises. Can we learn from planetary crises by studying national ones? Is this your next book? Sounds like a setup. <laughs> <laughs> Two questions. Is this my next book? No, this is not my next book. <laughs> I, not because this is an interesting question, but because I have another subject for my, for my next book, which will be revealed to you for years from now. Oh, okay. And is so, there something? Nancy, is Nancy, there something this is Reg. Can I, 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 actually, Eve is sitting in my place. Could she have, she wanted to do a question earlier on? Oh, no, 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 no
I will close the meeting. Is there time for another question? And then I will thank our incredible speakers and our very, very attentive audience who asked some very important questions. But when you're ready, I will close the meeting, Nancy. Rich, did you have a comment? No. <laughs> I was Anybody else? Have any oh, I, I, do, I do have a question, um, Dr. Diamond. Um, Listening to the recent uh, United Nations Summit on Climate Change, how optimistic are you or otherwise about how we're doing addressing the, the global issue? How optimistic am I about how we're addressing climate change and other, other global issues? Um, there are ample reasons for pessimism. Um, I don't have to tell you what the reasons for pessimism are. What are the reasons for optimism? Um, there are reasons to be optimistic. One reason to be optimistic is that, that young people are uh, more intelligent and more concerned about the world's problems than our older people. Another reason for optimism is that, believe it or not, some, some big international businesses are among the major forces in the world today. 20 years ago, I would have said that big international businesses are the most destructive forces in the world. But uh, in my role on the board of directors of World Wildlife Fund, we have a lot to do with big international businesses like Walmart and Unilever and even oil companies. And while it's a mixed bag, many of the, some, some of these big international businesses have recognized that these big global problems are bad for their bottom line. And they're also bad for the children and grandchildren of the CEO. So that big businesses are among the major constructive forces in the world today. In short, I'm cautiously optimistic. And if you ask me to put a number on it, I would say, I would say the chances are at least 51% that we will have a happy outcome to the world's problems and no more than 49% that we will mess up in the next 30 years. Well, I'll, Nancy, do you, can you hear me now? I can sure. hear you, yeah. Eve, please wrap up our meeting and thank all you for right. driving. Well, first of all, again, very, very big thank you for Dr. Jared Diamond and Regis Kelly who's sitting here with me. And again, our audience, I learned a lot. I'll tell you what makes me optimistic. I think we have enough very bright people. Let's call them people who think, thinkers. And we will pay attention. And with that paying of attention, I think we will come hopefully to a better place. Jared, do you share my optimism? <laughs> yes. Okay, but well, that's a beautiful way to close. Thank you very, very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you. Wonderful. That's very interesting because you read about that in the papers all, all the time. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Diamond, thank you, Nancy. You're yeah. Wonderful evening, really. Great. Thank you. Nancy, well, uh, shall I sign off? You may. Everybody may. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.